So in this video, we're going to talk about pressure in fluid systems, starting with a fundamental discussion about what pressure really is. So pressure is defined as the force exerted per unit area on a surface. And accordingly, we can see the equation to calculate the pressure as follows. We have P, which is typically what's used to denote the pressure, is equal to the force F divided by the area A. And we can see this illustrated below. We have some specific area. We have the force that's being applied to it. And if we want to determine the pressure, we can simply divide the force by the area. And pressure has enormous practical implications. Pressure is much like temperature, where it plays a role in some way, shape, or form in almost everything. Perhaps it doesn't play the primary role, as it might in something like a pneumatic system that we'll talk more about shortly, but pressure is always present and always relevant and very often has significant implications. So because pressure determines how fluids exert force in systems like pipes, containers, and various types of machinery, it is extremely important in fields like engineering, manufacturing and processing, and so on and so forth. Again, if you're transporting something, if you're storing something, if you're performing a chemical reaction, in all of these different scenarios, pressure will play a key role and must be understood and managed precisely. So now let's talk about a specific type of pressure and one that is especially relevant to fluid systems, and that is hydrostatic pressure. And the hydrostatic pressure is the pressure that's exerted by a fluid at rest and due to its weight. So the formula for hydrostatic pressure can be seen here, where we have P, again representing the pressure, is equal to the product of three different terms. We have rho, which is the fluid density. We have G, which is simply the gravitational constant. It represents gravitational acceleration. And lastly, we have H, which is the depth, or often it's called the height of the fluid. So let's take an example here of two fish in a fish tank, one labeled A and one labeled B. Well, fish A is sitting lower in the tank, while fish B is much closer to the water line. So this means that the volume of water above fish A is much greater than the volume of water above fish B, which means above fish A, the weight of this fluid is much greater. So if we return to our formula, Again, this is why the height or the depth makes such a significant difference. Because if you are deeper underwater or under a different liquid, well then there's more pressure from the weight of that fluid. G will be constant so long as we're talking about anything here on Earth. But if we want to look at rho, this is the fluid density. So density is the mass per unit area. So if we have more density, then this volume of fluid will ultimately weigh more than if it was the same volume of a less dense material. So that's why density is also included in this equation. So hydrostatic pressure increases with depth and is uniform at the same horizontal level in a fluid. So we've already discussed how it increases with depth, but let's talk more about how it's uniform at the same horizontal level. That is to say, if we had another fish, we could call it fish C and represent it with this star here. So this is at the same horizontal as fish A, so they're at the same depth. Well, everything along this horizontal will experience the same hydrostatic pressure because it has the same amount, the same weight of liquid above it. So these are the two most important things to understand about hydrostatic pressure. Again, it increases with depth and is uniform at the same horizontal level in a fluid. So let's continue our conversation about hydrostatic pressure by looking at another example and then talking about two important principles. So again, we'll start by looking at another example of the effects of hydrostatic pressure. So here we have three different tanks with three holes cut out in each tank. We have a upper hole, a hole more in the middle of the tank, and one closer to the bottom of the tank. Now you can see A, B, and C represent different positions for each of these streams to land. Now only one of them is correct and the other two are not. So which one is correct? Well, the correct answer is C. So let's think about this. Again, hydrostatic pressure increases as you go down. So the more water that is above 
then the greater the weight and therefore the greater the pressure. So in option C, we can see that the hole at the bottom is ejecting water the farthest. And oppositely, the hole at the top is ejecting water the closest. And again, this makes sense because the hole at the top is under the least amount of pressure of the three holes, where the hole at the bottom is under the most pressure. So it will exert the most force and therefore it will travel the farthest. Now, moving on from this example and talking about hydrostatic pressure explicitly, there's a few important cases that we should cover. Now, the first is that of a splitting or merging pipe. So if you have a splitting or merging pipe, they retain the same overall force. So for example, in this case, we have one larger pipe where we can have water traveling through, which will break into two different paths through these two different pipes. Now, yes, it will be distributed across the two pipes, but the overall force will remain the same. Likewise, we can return to the Venturi effect, which we talked about in a previous video. And the big takeaway here is that smaller cross sections increase velocity and reduce pressure. So again, if we don't have a changing hydrostatic pressure across the whole pipe, well then the pressure here at this region and this region, so all other regions besides this center portion here, when it goes from that cross section to a smaller cross section, there will be an increase in velocity and a reduction in pressure. So it's important to keep these in mind when you're analyzing pressurized systems, specifically in pipes, which is quite common in these contexts. Okay, now let's consider some of the applications of pressure in both liquids and gases a little bit further, and we'll start with that of liquids. And we will, in fact, start with one of the most important applications, which is that of hydraulic systems. And hydraulic systems use fluid pressure to transmit force. So we have one example, one illustration of a simple hydraulic system here at the top left, which is composed of two pistons. We have one on the left and one on the right. So when a force is applied to, for example, this left piston, it will translate downwards, pressure will build, and that pressure will be used to do work, which in this case will be to raise this piston on the right side of the hydraulic system. And there are a few different things to note. The first is that you'll see that this is a closed system, which means that nothing inside can get outside. So the fluid that's being used to transmit force cannot simply escape, because if it could, again, no pressure could build, and no work could be done. Now the other important thing to note is that this must be an incompressible fluid. And what I mean is, for example, when a force is applied to this piston and it translates down, it won't be compressing this liquid into a denser fluid. The molecules will not be getting closer together. Instead, the pressure will be building, it will not compress, it will not change its volume, and it will be used again to apply a force to this side of the hydraulic system. So again, it's important that it is a closed system. It is important that it is an incompressible fluid. Now, the other thing to mention here is simply that pressure, as it's suggested in the name, is typically thought of as pressing. It's pressing fluid together. Now, again, this is often the case, but it's important to note that pressure can also be used to pull. So you can think of siphons, you can think of certain vacuum scenarios. In cases where there's certain relative pressure scenarios, pressure can be used to pull just as much as to push. Another common example is that of dams, which are designed to withstand hydrostatic pressure with depth. So here we can see one example of a more optimally designed dam here. And of course, it's essential that dams are indeed designed to withstand hydrostatic pressure, because if they didn't, not only is it an enormous waste of time and money, but a failed dam can be catastrophic and put many lives in danger. Then we can move on to gases, where we can briefly talk about atmospheric pressure. So atmospheric pressure decreases with altitude, affecting weather and breathing, among many other things. So as we go up in the atmosphere, the pressure decreases. And we can take a look at the example of a mountain climber. So if the mountain being climbed is sufficiently high, well, the atmospheric pressure might be far lower than what we're used to here on sea level or anywhere closer. Now, this will affect the type and quantity of different gases in the atmosphere. It will affect how the mountain climber's body is able to ingest and process gases. It has so many implications, and we're only talking about the example of a mountain climber. 
and we're only referring to a specific type of pressure. Then we can move on to machines that actually used pressurized gases for their very function. And many of these machines qualify as what's called pneumatic systems. And pneumatic systems are those that use compressed air to power tools and machines, if they are not tools and machines themselves. So one common and very simple example is that of a bike pump, where externally applied force is used to push air into the confined space of a tire. This increases the pressure, and this is necessary for the tire to perform its role. But again, this is just the beginning of what pneumatic systems encompass, and there are so many fascinating pneumatic systems that play a critical role in our everyday lives, and most of us don't even know it. So let's summarize some of the key information from this lesson. First of all, pressure is the force exerted per unit area on a surface, and the formula is as follows. We can simply take the applied force, F, divided by the area, A. Again, it is defined as the force exerted per unit area, so the equation for pressure is simply force divided by area. Then we moved on to talk about a specific type of pressure that's highly relevant to fluid dynamics, which is hydrostatic pressure, or the pressure exerted by a fluid at rest and due to its weight. And we also had a formula for the hydrostatic pressure, which you can see here. It is P is equal to rho times G times H, where rho is the fluid density, G is gravitational acceleration, or the gravitational constant, and H is the depth. Now, pressure is relevant and important to countless systems and scenarios for both liquids and gases. Some common examples include hydraulic and pneumatic pumps and machines, dams, weather patterns, and again, so much more. The importance and relevance of pressure cannot be understated.